All right. Ricardo, it is such a pleasure to be here with you today, and I'm really looking forward to the next 25 minutes together. Exactly 20 years ago, you co-founded King, the maker of Candy Crush, and with this, you helped pioneer the era of mobile gaming. You welcome billions of players to this form of entertainment. You entered pop culture, and with King, you've created one of Europe's biggest success stories. And to this day, Candy Crush remains one of the top games played globally. It's been downloaded more than three billion times. Truly incredible. Um, to kick us off, given your journey and given how far the industry has come, what's your take on where mobile gaming is today, 20 years on since you founded King? Good morning to everyone, first of all. Uh, yeah, it's been a long journey. I've been doing King for 18 years. Uh, I left four years ago, so I've been watching now what's happening in industry from, from the sidelines in some way. But it's super interesting because a few things surprised me. So one of the things that surprised me is that in, a, in, a, in an environment which, ha which has become extremely competitive, there is, it's still possible actually to emerge and build uh, basically unicorn, unicorn companies. I mean, a good example is one of the index investments, Dream, uh, Dream Games. And, and you can do so with um, taking elements that actually are pretty proven and having a fantastic, perfect execution on these. So that's been surprising. I think that has also been surprising to me is we sold uh, Candy, we sold King in 2016. And since then, Candy has been doing extremely well. So has been, the revenues have been growing and it's become a key part of Activision. Now Activision just sold to Microsoft. And, is, and, and Candy is, is, is is doing incredibly well, still one of the top games in, uh, in the world, uh, both in terms of reach and monetization. And fundamentally, when we went public in 2014, everyone was talking about diver diversification. And when we met and we worked together with Activision, he, they were talking about diversification. So in the sense that when you have a game that does really well, what is proven also is that you have longevity in the games. So you don't always have to come up with the next game, but if a game is really strong, has a strong brand, a strong user base, if you focus on execution, on making the game better, surprising in the game, hmm. and, uh, and you keep customers entertained, you can actually keep them for a very long time, and the game is, is still there in the top charts. And I think Dream Games is another example of that. I appreciate the mention of Dream Games, of course, another company that we've been fortunate to, to partner with. And actually, one thing that I've learned from both Sonar, CEO of Dream Games, and from some of the conversations that you and I have been having is that product is at the core, and it all starts with the product, and that you don't need to innovate across every area of the product. But you need to have that culture of excellence, and every decision has to be well-balanced and really well thought through. So just to build on what you were saying, how, how do you create that kind of culture of excellence across every area of the product? Maybe I start one, one step before in, in terms of the topic of innovation versus execution and how is, import, how is one important versus the other. I'm a big believer that if you want to have success, especially if it's in a very competitive environment, uh, marketing is cheap if the, if the product you have is not just useful but also innovative. And innovative for me means distinctive from what the competition is offering. And if you don't, then marketing is very expensive. Um, and if the product is distinctive and useful, then the users will also talk about it, we recommend it to others, and therefore marketing is, is cheaper at the end. Now, how do you create something that is innovative in, a, in, in this industry? And here, talking about our experience, you know, we, never, we were never first. Uh, we were not first on Facebook, and we were not first on mobile. And when we launched the first time on Facebook, everyone said, guys, forget it, the market is already, is already established, Zynga got already 80% market share, it's so much, bigger, so much bigger, they will copy you anyway if you come up with something new. And, uh, and then in mobile also, when we launched later on mobile, we were not the first. So what did we do? So we did not follow what all the others were doing. When we launched on Facebook, everyone was focused on resource management games with Zynga first of all. And what we did before, launching on Facebook, we created a lot of games, more than 200 games on the web. So we took the best games that we created at the time and reproposed them 
with a core gameplay that was a match three. So we didn't innovate on the core gameplay. But where we innovated was taking elements that were proven, but putting them together in a new way. So the, the, the match three game that was very shallow, we made many more levels, and we allowed you to play with other players in a non-competitive way, seeing them on a map, which now everyone is doing, but at the time no one was doing. Everyone was focusing on resource management. And, uh, and that's where I think innovation comes, in a way that you don't need to invent everything. Once, if you try to invent everything at the same time, then it's actually, the risk becomes massive. You can come up with something like a new Minecraft, but the chances that you do are very slim and it's very tough. If you take elements that are easier for the user to understand and to get into, and then you innovate around it so that the user actually prefers your game versus others and wants to recommend it, that's when suddenly you have something that has high retention, and when you have high retention, then that's the base for everything. From there, you can uh, do marketing and, uh, and, scale, the, and scale the company. Um, and so how do you know when you have a winner? Uh, well, our metric, our key metric was retention, and is retention also. So anything that is over 40% day one is a good game. To give you, put it in perspective, Candy Crush, when we launched it, was 65% day one retention. And once you, once you have, and that, that was the start. And when you have that, then you can optimize and make it better. And from there, you can increase and optimize the day, day two, day seven, day 30 retention, and make sure that the users basically stay. And then you can also apply the monetization and then innovate also monetization. We innovated also on that side. But the retention is the number one. If the retention is not good, then you lose the customers, and there is no way that uh, you can optimize. Any, any optimization after that is, is hard work. And at what point can you tell? You know, some games, they start off with some retention and then they keep iterating and tweaking to try and improve it. How, how much can you improve it? And at what point do you make the decision that this retention will not be increasing? Let's think of something new. And at what point do you actually keep tweaking to get to that retention you need? Yeah. I think the, the bar was 40%. So anything that is, and the issue is, when it's below, it's very easy because you just shut, shut down the game. If it's very high, it's an obvious one. You put all the resources there, like Candy Crush. The question is, if you have something in between, you're stuck in between 40% and it's not as high as some of the competitors, what do you do then? I think the answer there depends very much on the company. So in the case of King, we had a massive hit with Candy Crush. So all resources went there, and it's actually very difficult then to reroute users from Candy, where you know you have a retention that is super high, you have a monetization that is incredibly high, to a game that is not performing as well. But if, for example, you don't have the luxury of having a Candy Crush, then actually 40% with good monetization might be perfectly good to build a user base, and then you can innovate with the next game, and you have a user base to use to launch a game to then grow the, the, and, and launch the next game. Because what we did to launch, on, uh, to launch Candy Crush, we launched Candy Crush on a base of existing users on Facebook. And um, the, the launch of Candy Crush actually was extremely disappointing. I, it was one of the days where I got most angry than ever because we were promised by Apple that they would feature us. And the day of the launch, we actually didn't get featured. And so I said, ah, you know, <laughs> it's the most important day. We want to launch this game. We think this game is doing really well. And we didn't get featured. It was the luckiest day ever because we took uh, the decision to launch immediately also on, on Google. Right. which meant we could immediately offer the game to the entire user base we had on the web, and we connected web play and, uh, and mobile play, so web play, play on their PC and play on mobile. So all the users we had on the PC could immediately play on their mobile device, and so you had the full variety across all the platforms. Wow. And the most important thing was we had clean numbers, because we, because we didn't get featured, we knew exactly how many users were coming from our installed user base, how many users were coming from marketing, and we could start to understand better the, the customer lifetime value mm. and the variety of the game without any disruptions or interference from other sources. So you've, you've pioneered in many ways mobile gaming, clearly also cross-platform gaming with Facebook and, uh, and mobile, which, which perhaps is, is less familiar to everyone. You touched on marketing. That's something that you did phenomenally well at King. Can you share a little bit about how to approach distribution and marketing, especially in this time of IDFA and difficulty getting reach for mobile applications? Yeah. So I think what most people don't know is that actually King had a very strong data 
infrastructure. We had about 100 people, 100 business, business analysts um, that basically do nothing else than checking all the numbers. And we, we were very, very good at, at, at understanding everything, uh, both within the game, but also on the, on the customer acquisition side. And the way how we scaled the company was entirely organic. So we didn't raise a penny to, to scale. Wow. And we went from very little marketing investment to spending around $100 million per quarter in marketing. And the way how we did it was with the, the chessboard strategy. The chessboard strategy means you put one coin on the, first, on the first square, you see how the first cohort develops, and as soon as you see that the metrics of the first cohort uh, are, are very healthy, and you see what basically the, 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 the monetization is over the first week, second week, as soon as that cohort allows you, as you say, okay, this is actually a very strong, very strong matrix, you invest in the, second, in the second square of the chessboard. And this time you double up. And if the second cohort in the first week performs like the first cohort in the first week, in the meantime, you have also the numbers from the first cohort over a longer period of time. And you also can assume the second cohort will behave in a similar way like the first cohort of users. So you can then make the investment in the third chessboard, in the third, in the third square of the chessboard, but this time you double up again. And if you do that, you have suddenly an exponential curve mm. where you go from very little marketing investment to investing $100 million per quarter, completely organically. And when we started, because of the innovation we were bringing and we were distinct from others, and we also integrated in the business model virality, because the first model we started with was freemium, where you would play the game, you would get five lives. When the five lives finish, you could either uh, wait 24 hours or you could pay 99, uh, sorry, 99 cents and play immediately, or you could invite three friends, which basically was free marketing. So virality was integrated in the business mm. model. Mm. And, uh, and it was absolutely key for us to be able to, to grow fast. I love that chessboard uh, mention, something I haven't heard before. How closely do product and marketing need to work together in this context? Um, very closely, very, very closely. And, uh, and we monitored all the, all the changes on the, on the, for example, live ops. Live ops is something that, that, we, that we launched at some point, and we said, OK, actually, we see that actually users want more content. But if you launch more content only at the end of the journey, you make only the players who actually finish the game or happy. And, and for the others, it becomes a bit boring after a while, always the same, the same level. So we launched live ops with special, special events that are available only for a specific moment of time. Um, and we got the idea because we were looking at, uh, at a study that was comparing London with, with Paris. And they were saying, OK, why do tourists always go to London when actually when you ask them, they actually would like to go to Paris? And they did a study which said that actually because in, in London there are more events that are time limited. So you can go to this exhibition, but the exhibition is only available in August. If you don't go in August, then you will never see it again. So, Tourists said, OK, actually, I, want to, I would love to go to Paris, but if I don't go now to London, I will miss out on that exhibition. And the, that's where we started thinking, OK, actually, we should do the same also right. for, for games. And then we launched LiveOps. Wow. Amazing. I love that. Um, we've obviously talked a little bit about Candy Crush and the incredible success you had with Candy Crush. But you founded King in 2003. Candy Crush launched in 2012. And so arguably, it wasn't quite the overnight success. What were those early eight to nine years like? And how did you stay motivated? Oh, Jesus. Uh, we, <laughs> we almost went bust three times in that time. And uh, I think the hardest times, it took us two and a half years to take our games from the web to Facebook. So you have to imagine, we started with a new model in Europe, which was skill games. At the time, no one was doing skill games. No one had heard about skill games, i.e. games where you would compete against others, uh, either for fun or for a small entry fee, and then you could also win some real money. So it was not gambling because it was based on pure skill. And so we had on one side to demonstrate that this model was absolutely based on skill, so it was not gambling. We didn't need a gambling license. And everything was fine because we managed to convince all the largest portals in Europe to work with us. And we became the largest partner of Yahoo, first in Europe and then in the US. And if you went to the Yahoo Games channel, we were, we were busy there. We were the, the busy doing their, uh, powering their, their games business. Until in uh, 2007, Facebook opened up 
their, 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 their portal, their, their, their software, their, their, their product to, to games. And that's where Zynga launched. And then it took a bit of time, but in 2008, 2009, it started growing like exponentially, and Facebook killed Yahoo, and killed Yahoo especially in the games area. So we lost, we were the largest partner of Yahoo, and Yahoo lost in their games channel 45% of their users in one year. And we lost 45% of, of the new users in one year. And, it, and if you are there, you have no idea what's happening. It felt like if some, someone took the, the carpet under your, under your feet, and uh, it took us two and a half years to actually crack the model because Facebook did not allow us to take our skill model to Facebook. And that put, put us with the back to the wall and we had to find a new way to bring our games to Facebook. And uh, anything that is bad, actually, uh, if you work on it, can become very good. And for us, maybe if we had not been with the back to the wall, we would not have been pushed so hard to innovate and change completely our business model. Because what we did in the skill gaming model, all the games we offered were only one level, which mm. would compete over three minutes with other people. Mm. And we had developed more than 200 games. When we went to Facebook, we took the best of these games, only one level, and made out of these, these games much deeper games with many more levels. And that's something that at the time no one was doing. And, and we innovated on the model in this way. I love what you said, everything bad has something good. And you clearly have an incredible determination and ability to really uh, pursue where you want to go. How do you motivate other people to also be, come, be, be like that and come along with you on this journey when things maybe aren't going well? I think for me the most important thing is honesty and transparency. So even during the bad times, we were extremely honest and transparent on one side with our board, with the investors, and on the other side with the team. Mm. So, we, didn't, we never said, oh, don't worry, everything is going well and uh, everything is fine, because we treated our team as adults, saying, look, this is where we are and these are the things we are doing to, to change things. And the best way to do that is to use visuals. And the, visuals, the visual that I used at the time was a character called Mordillo, and uh, not many people know it, but it's a character. And we show this character uh, lying down on the beach under an umbrella, under the sun, sipping a cocktail. And I, saw, and I said, this is where we are. Today, everything is fine. This, this was in the beginning of 2009. And we started seeing the big impact on, uh, of Facebook on us and on Yahoo and on us. See, this is where we are. And then I zoomed out and I showed it was an hourglass. So the sand underneath was flowing, was flowing down. And I was saying, OK, this is where we are. It's only a matter of time that we're going to be out of business and we need to change. We have time. And that's the reason why we split the company. And you guys, 50% of the company is, is working on keeping the lights on and you have zero resources for innovation. You only have resources to keep the lights on, and thanks to your work, we're able to have the other 50% of the company, which we are dividing in five teams, uh, working on five different experiments. And these are the five experiments. So that's how we managed to keep people with us, and, and then we kept them updated on how the experiments were going. I mean, you... you what I've heard from many is that you're an incredible motivator of people and clearly a fantastic leader. Is this something that has come naturally to you or is this something that you had to work on? Uh, I don't know. I think for me the key way of thinking, the key, basically the starlight, has always been treat the others how you want to be treated yourself. So I always thought if I was on the other side, how do I want to be treated? I want to be treated like an adult. I don't want to be told stories that are not real. And, and I want to be part of the solution, not, not, uh, not part potentially of the problem. And so that's how I always acted in anything I did. Um, and actually, before King, we did another company called Spray, which was an early, early startup in 99. And we ended up selling the company to Lycos. And I ended up, because Lycos moved location and so on, I ended up firing all the people I had hired. So I fired 100 people. Oh. And I fired them in a way as if I wanted to be fired. So very honest, I told them how things were, what I can do, what I cannot do, and I gave, I, really honestly. And when we started King, since we had not a penny for marketing, we only, no one wanted to give us money, so I put in 100% of my money in it, so I didn't have any money for marketing, I went knocking the doors, and the first doors I knocked were the doors of the people I fired, which in the meantime were working at large portals like T-Online and Yahoo and so on. 
So you always meet twice. I think that's, uh, that's a key thing in the industry. That's right. You always, first impressions matter, last impressions. The last mile is the most important. Yeah, yeah. I, I could speak for a very long time with you about this. These are very important questions. How to think about culture, setting that from the top, like you mentioned. I know we're coming up on time shortly. How would you advise founders today who are thinking about launching a gaming business in this era of post-COVID, era of AI? Mm -hmm. What would be your guidance to everyone in the room? Um, well, I can tell you where, what I'm focused on now, where I think it's, it's interesting. I think I'm a big believer in, uh, in AI. Uh, I think AI is a tool, so you need to know how to apply this tool. Otherwise, if it's just a black box, I think it's, it's, it's not useful enough, uh, especially in games where you need to, where the results in the short term can be very different from results in the long term when you look at numbers. Uh, but I think AI can have a massive impact on games because I think the, the example of dream games, that perfect execution can really take you to the top, can allow you to monetize at a better level than others. And monetizing better means that you can acquire customers and have a payback on the customer that you acquire faster than others, and therefore you can break through the roof. Um, and that's AI can have an impact at all stages. It can have an impact on the, on the, on the marketing, having better performance marketing, understanding better the numbers, doing, um, optimizing the creatives, optimizing the channels, has a massive impact on the CLV, tracking the CLV, and, and optimizing the entire user experience. So I've been now spending time with a company, for example, called Metica, and we are mm. looking at, at optimizing the, for example, starting from where the money is in the shop. So every user gets a different experience, depending if, if a user is a heavy user or, or a, a more beginner. Uh, you, get a, you can get a different offering at different moments in time. And uh, I think that is going to give you a better performance over time, and it will also, therefore, allow you to buy at a better rate. Do you think we'll have AI native games? Uh, I think you will have much smaller teams in the future that will be able to innovate much faster and come up with games that where you actually play with the AI, AI becomes your partner, mm -hmm. and the game develops as you continue, as you progress, depending what route you have chosen, and also based on your personal interests. Okay, okay. Looking forward to, to it will be, more. I mean, you know, the, the beauty now is that uh, the world in, one thing is for sure, we, we don't know today what games will come out in three or five years from now and what games will be, but one thing is for sure, there will be a lot of innovation. There will be a lot of innovation. And one thing we know is the category continues to grow year over year also, and you've been fundamental in helping to pave that way. What are some final sort of words of advice that you would give to founders in the room, some core lessons or anything that you would have done differently looking back at your time over the past 20 years? For me, there are two key, two key things. Uh, you know, you, you touched briefly on culture, and, and the other point that I would also put in is hiring. Mm. So I think culture is fundamentally how you behave when you come into the company, and uh, you know, what time do I come in, how do I have to think? Am I innovative? Or how much can I innovate? Can I talk? Can I not talk? Can I take responsibility? So in innovation, and then the new people that come in always look up to the next level up, and the next level up looks again up. So fundamentally, it's the pyramid. So the founder creates the culture. So depending on how you behave, not what you say, not the papers, not the, the, the companies that come in with beautiful words, you create the culture. We don't have much time. The second key point is hiring. So always hire ahead of time. So hire where you want to be in two years from now, not where, where you are now. And, uh, and don't start hiring, um, hire senior guys that have seen this before. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and be, you know, the bar you put in hiring is, is what will develop, where the, where the company will develop, because good people hire good people, not good people hire not good people. And, uh, and if you start with not good people, it's very difficult that these people will hire people that are better than they are. So. Fantastic final words to end on. Hire people that are better than you. Yeah. Ricardo, thank you for doing this. You're an incredible uh, inspiration to many here in the room. You've defined the past 20 years. Excited to see what the next 20 years will bring and your role in the industry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.